Hello and welcome to this webinar about examples of how HR functions of all sizes can effectively use data and analytics to build their credibility with business leaders. I'm Dave Milner, also known as HR Curator in social media channels, and I'll be sharing six real examples from my recent book research of organisations, large and small, who are using HR data and analytics to help solve business challenges. I'll also explain some of the te techniques and approaches behind the examples so that you can start to use the same principles in your own organisation. So let's get on with it and let's start with a little bit of an overview of the research that was undertaken for the book. This was about 750 hours worth of interviews, meetings, workshops, research. And what effectively um, unfolded is that there are three big challenges for the HR function of the future, all of which are designed to help build their credibility, but also have an implication for their capability. We call these the three Ds, data, design and digital. Data is obviously what we're going to be exploring a little bit in this webinar and will revolve around the commercial mindset, the ability to get quality and relevant data, and obviously to start to build capability and governance and culture within the organisation so that analytics has a part to play. The design aspect, the second D, is really important. It's always interesting to try and find how HR is able to answer the question, how can you demonstrate strategic value? And for me, this is one of the additional ways that this can be done because organisations and leaders within them are looking for them to support them with strategic initiatives. That means they need to use some of the techniques of the past that seem to have been forgotten, such as job design, organisational design, and also scenario planning, all of them looking to try and build something which will help the organisation to understand what is required moving forward. Transformational initiatives are vital. So getting involved with automation, the implication on jobs, the implication on structures and job content, vital. And obviously the employee experience, which is being talked about significantly, is a real strategic initiative that needs to be embraced and taken forward by HR with the business. And finally, the future proofing of the talent practices. It's absolutely vital that they're using frameworks which are focused on 2025, not focused on 1995. It means we need to be looking at strategic workforce planning. We need to be making sure that we're focusing on personal learning and introducing methods and techniques that enable learning to be taken forward every day for every employee. The final D is digital no surprise there and that's about obviously building the core HR technology infrastructure focusing on efficiency and effectiveness but it's also looking at what specialized technology may be available that can help them um, such as in the area of people analytics for example but also there are all sorts of future technology innovations that are here or are coming our way so the areas of chatbots of AI of gamification of blockchain all of these have a part to play and HR has got to make sure that it understands the ethical and the implementation issues of all these technology innovations. So against those backdrop of the three Ds, let's start to explore the data one, which is what we're here to explore. I started off by talking about the commercial mindset. And for me, I think commercial mindset is at the heart of any analytics capability. We need to be able to understand the financial implications and the financial insight of the organisation that you're working for. That means we can ask smart questions and understand the context within which we're trying to address an issue. We need to have a view externally about what's going on. Do we know what, for example, our competitors are doing in the areas of recruitment and development? And we need to also understand internally the strategies of each of the different businesses that we're in connected with. What are they doing? How are they moving forward? And more importantly, what is the role of people in addressing and fulfilling those strategic imperatives? And the final one is about being organisationally savvy. We all know that we need to be smart about how we get things done in an organisation. And that's one of the critical things that we need to consider. Um, I wanted to just share a very simple example. And, and for me, at a very base level, 
analytics and the use of data can start with what I call is the time is money story. This is a, a true story. It's based in a UK organisation and it's based around what is a very traditional personnel HR activity, which is there's been a, a conflict, a dispute. And in the UK, that means that it then goes to a legislative court, a tribunal. So this is the process that was gone through in this sports and media organisation. Um, there were a number of different phases, investigation, preparation, and then obviously concluding what's been um, agreed as a result of the tribunal. Um, as you can see, um, there was a lot of time spent. And when you then allocate the cost of that time, and, and bear in mind that the cost of that time is not just salary, it's also cost of workspace, cost of technology, cost of mobile phones per employee. And when you start to work it out, it was found that to actually get to the tribunal, it cost just over £75,000. And that excluded opportunity costs, in other words, things they could have been doing instead of that, and a reputational risk, which is obviously a big issue when it comes to these types of issues. The interesting part of the story is that at phase one, when all the research was done, it was believed that, that an agreement could have been had with the employee um, to, to basically, why don't you sign this document and let's just move on and so that you can leave the organisation and we'll just both look at it as a, a, a conclusion that is satisfactory for both cases. £25,000, I think, was offered and it was believed that if further amount of money had been offered at that stage, the whole case would have been closed. However, what happened is that the case went to the tribunal, the organisation lost the case, they had to pay £45,000 plus costs, so that was £60,000. And when there was a debrief by the HR director with the CEO, the CEO said, you're telling me that this process has cost £135,000. Was it worth going through that process? Was the reputational risk worth over £100,000? Should we have paid her off at the start? And, and the issue is, is that the ego of the CEO had driven that activity of, I'm not going to give in on this, this is what we're going to do. But when looked at the hard costs based around time, guess what? It was a slightly different and certainly more circumspect CEO that was found. So the commerciality for me is a really important part. And the very basic thing that we can all do is turn our activity into time. And, and I think it's quite interesting when you do that because it enables people, executives and leaders to start to understand that the salary of every employee shouldn't just be written off. It's a real cost. And it, more importantly, particularly when you're looking at salespeople, has a real opportunity cost. So let's move on to the, the people analytics journey. Um, with our research, we, did, uh, we worked with a whole number of vendors and Cruncher in um, um, Holland was very supportive and very helpful to us. And so we, we build up what we call the capability model. Now I need to say right up front, this does not mean every organization has to evolve through each of these different stages. Some organizations will start at four, some will start at two, some will start at three, some may still be struggling to get onto level one. Let's just look briefly at each of these different levels because the model is here to help describe what needs to be done once you've identified where you are. It's not about I'm better than you, I'm doing more, I'm progressing quicker than you. So at level one, this is about ad hoc metrics. This is about having lots of data, which is probably not integrated particularly well. Um, probably quite reactive to different business demands and probably have got a lot of data in isolation, which therefore makes the analytical process quite quite difficult to do. So it, it's about getting data, but it, it's a little bit opportunistic. It's a bit ad hoc. The next level two is where we're probably looking at, you've got an HRIS system, and not just got an HRIS system, but you're using it for operational reporting, you're using it for benchmarking, making decisions. You may well have some specialist HR metrics specifically for your organization. And you may well be producing um, dashboards which give a summary of data. Please just a, a word of a cautionary note here. Remember that dashboards are useful for HR to understand operationally where they're at, 
Remember, executives may not be interested. Level three is then the strategic HR. And this is where we're then starting to get into one-off um, pieces of research and activity because we've got the database at level two and we're now starting to think about what we could do with the data. So this may be we're looking at causes of issues, looking at correlations, looking at implications, starting to come up with those sorts of models. And then at level four is then really where we've developed not just a series of complex models and methods and techniques, but you may have somebody who's particularly adept at doing this piece of work. You may, in larger corporates, have a center of ex expertise in analytics, but certainly uh, the ultimate for me at level four is that HR should be thinking as a profit center because the ultimate gain of using data is to demonstrate value. And if we're aligning and using HR and business data together, there is an opportunity to demonstrate tangibly the value of our talent practices. Let me try and bring it to life with some examples, but, but just remember that, you know, as you look at this, um, technology is evolving all the time. So in due course, there may well be very smart technologies that we can talk to, which will be able to do some of this analysis for us. So um, I think the key thing is that I am not advocating that every HR practitioner should be a data geek. What I am advocating is that every practitioner should have some numerical orientation and certainly based on commercials, based on business and based on understanding what the numbers are saying, these are vital because particularly if you've got people who are operating at level four, you're going to have experts that you're working with. But at the end of the day, you as the HR practitioner are the person that's diagnosing the issue and probably telling the story at the end in terms of this is what the data is saying. OK, some very simple examples. So at level one, this is a charitable organisation in the UK called the British Heart Foundation. And um, they are trying to shift their HR and people function into becoming a more evidence based one. So that's the challenge that they have. They have decided that they uh, the method they've gone through is they've done a whole series of different facilitation sessions with key stakeholders to understand what data is available, what are the priorities, what are the systems issues and challenges culturally that they need to do so that they've now developed a roadmap. And the roadmap is now, from an outcome point of view, is now starting to be mapped out, starting to be implemented. And so they're starting to align and understand what the changes mean, both for HR, but also for the business. And I guess the reason I wanted to share this as an example is uh, if you are starting from the beginning, it's, it's a journey, it takes time and planning is really important. You can't just go at it and hope that it's going to stick. You need to understand that we're providing data and information to make better informed decisions. Let me look at now level two. This is the Admiral Group, and this is where they've got an HRR system, but they've got disparate systems all over the globe. And they're now finding that they're having to comply with financial regulations that are being brought in externally. So they've now used unifying technology to pull this together. And by doing that, that now means that they're able to not only look at core HR challenges and issues, but also able to inform the HR business partners so that they can act as one when they're all working across the different businesses, across the different regions. But they're enabling, they now got access to data that makes decisions quicker, more reliable, and they're able to back them up. And it also means that they're able to um, fulfill the external demands that are being made on them. And so that's where they've really pulled different systems together to make sure that they can really be unified and add value. At level three, remember this is where we're now starting to move from just a, a reporting basis, but now starting to look into a more analytical basis. And this is a true story of a, of a, a retail convenience store in the UK had a, a business critical job of a store manager and 30% of the job holders were leaving every year. Um, so that was pretty extreme. Business growth was flat. There was a, a, a recruitment process from a time and money point of view that was costing half a million pounds a year. And it, it was basically very crude, very rudimentary, and it wasn't really measuring anything. 
a new process was devised for this organisation and it was told that it would probably cost £600,000 in terms of products, in terms of time to actually implement it. So the CEO said, that sounds great, but show me the money. So to build a business case, finance and HR then collaborated, worked together and started to look at their cash flow projections because they've got data on every store in terms of what it had done historically and where it should be performing moving forward. There was found to be differences between high and okay performers in the stores of 400% in sales and 190% in profitability. And then those cash flow projections were then used to then ask the question, well, what if we recruited more high performers and didn't just use the terrible recruitment process? What difference would that make to the performance of the stores? And so with some conservative, and I, and I mean conservative cash flow changes, the finance team then predicted that over the next three years, they believed that profitability would be increased by 100,000, 250,000 and 275,000 over the coming three years, remembering that margins in retail are very, very small. Um, the, the process change was signed off by the CEO. The recruitment process um, was put in place, training was undertaken and there was a lot of big support throughout. Um, as we now look back over the three years, um, the profits that were increased were by 95,000 to 263,000 and 278,000 pounds. So obviously um, the predictions were pretty accurate. The implications of changing it have been quite significant. And also they found that the key job holders, those key store managers, they, the amount of um, retrition that they now had was at 6.9%, so it had fallen significantly. And that's a great success story. There's a but, and my but is that the sales director was one of the great advocates of this process. And due to his success, he was stolen, chosen by a larger organisation to then go and run their sales function. The new salesperson came in and he then reverted back to the old way of doing things, less evidentially based. Um, the, the ultimate outcome was that 18 months later, the organisation um, went into administration and ceased to exist. Um, so I'm not saying that analytics has a, a do or die element to it, but what I'm saying is it's really important that whatever you do, you sustain it over a period of time. I wanted to give you another level three example because this is more around the augmented analytics, the use of machine learning um, and uh, to, to try and understand what is going on in an organisation. This is an organisation called Enable. Um, it's a productivity and leadership organisation, um, it's a vendor, and I've worked with them in, in helping to address an issue with a Dubai government department. They had an issue where to increase productivity they just had to increase headcount and obviously that's not sustainable um, and obviously created a number of issues from a cost point of view so they needed to what they call decouple decouple the output growth from the headcount growth so they used a method called trigger task time algorithm which basically observes the employee's way of working how they operate what their work patterns are and it uses it to predict different ways of operating if they um, undertook, for example, outliers behavior or outliers um, approaches. And that, that therefore enables changes to be made, which a leader can take forward with their employees and their teams to try and improve it incrementally, all in a very transparent, open way. So just to give you the, an indication of the power of data based on four functions, 12 months of process data, 480 million rows of data from 12 different systems. We found a number of key things. Only 1.1% of the work led to its intended result. There was a 261% task variance. So in other words, the people who did it really well, the outliers did it 261% better than the people who did it really badly. From an outcome point of view, 65,000 hours were replaced due to poor, due to poor process and capability. An additional 270,000 hours were um, identified through improved workforce capacity. And ultimately, 11.5% productivity increase was achieved. 
And one of the interesting things I remember is that um, you need to ensure that you're talking to employees all the time because a lot of this were changes that the employees could see, but obviously they weren't being asked and it needed the data to undertake that for it. So my final example is at level four. And this for me is a, is a great example from Experian. Um, attrition was a real issue globally. It was 4% higher than the benchmark and it was putting a strain on the business. They think it was costing about $3 million a year. So um, this is an organization that went almost straight to level four. It didn't have the infrastructure in place, but it had some smart people because Experian is made up of data scientists. So they built a data-driven analytics solution. And what they were trying to do was to try and understand the, the different benefits of an employee that they had, the value that they demonstrated, and which retention strategies were being more successful. By implementing this, they've been able to reduce global attrition by 4%, and they believe that it's probably saved them about $14 million over two years. The culture and the approach of HR has completely changed to a very proactive data-led function, and they're now embracing predictive um, anal analytics and modeling, which is really helping them to understand the implications of training, pay decisions, and how to retain female talent in a better way. The final part of this is that they're now selling that tool, this retention tool, externally to other organizations so that HR in Experian is now a profit center. So the, those examples have gone up in increasing complexity. Um, and within the book, what we've tried to do is we've tried to provide a, a very simple playbook and framework, which has been supported and helped with insight from John Penson of People Insights in Canada. And what we've tried to do is to really take you through from your, um, your own KPIs through to the behavior that you need to change to become more analytically orientated, better at questioning, more, more commercial, through to what are the sort of infrastructure implications that need to be thought through by the HR community with your business leaders. And then obviously every analytics project is a change activity. So how do we make sure that it's implemented, embedded, and how do you continue to develop your capability? So on that one slide that you can see, there is probably two days of a workshop there. But I guess what I'm trying to say is that it can be done. You can make the shift. It's about a mindset change and it's about changing the behavior that you use from a commercial orientation to embrace the people focus and the people thought leadership that you advocate. So as I, as I sort of come to the conclusion, we did a lot of research and we found, I think that the this is a time when opportunities are existing for HR like never before, whether there's a, a virus, whether there is another external business challenge coming our way, HR has great opportunities, but we need to be faster, leaner and smarter than we've ever been before. We've identified within our research six areas of what the future HR practitioner may well need to embrace. And as you can see, one of them is called a data and analytics translator. And what I'm saying is I need you to be able to translate data and information into insights, into stories, into implementable solutions for your business. I do not necessarily need you to be a data geek, but obviously if you're able to improve your numerical orientation, obviously using analytics and HR courses to do it, then that's great. But I think if you then embrace the different six roles that, that, are, that are there and then start to look at the increasing technology infrastructure which is undoubtedly becoming available it's really making sure that we have to within HR move from being a service station in other words I can come and go as I please to being more of a power station just remember what it's like when the lights go out everybody moans and groans but they're in essence a power which we rely upon and which we need and which we draw on when it's absolutely vital and for me that's the, work, the role that HR has to fulfill. We do some great stuff currently, but we have to really have a very clear strategic agenda, focusing on proactive business growth, turning our talent practices into activities that 
executives can understand where the true financial value is because that's where we build our credibility is when we start to turn our commercial focus into embracing people challenges and solving them. Key learnings, uh, and I'm not going to dwell on these, but I think there is still a perception issue. We need to get clear about what success looks like for our functions and what strategy truly means. For me, I think it's about future focus and about design. And, and I think we need to have a behavior change that's very clearly orientated on the commercialism and the commercial challenges that you face. I think it's vital that every HR practitioner has a toolkit of tips and ideas to help you on this journey. It takes time. You didn't necessarily join HR to become a data orientated person, but that's the world we're now in. And data and technology is going to be key enablers for you in your future role. I think when I look at it from an analytics focus, please think in monetary terms. Time is money and please use the language of the business. Simple is good. So, you know, you've got to make sure that what we do is meaningful and that decisions that are based on data have clear evidence. And if you haven't got the evidence, get some clear hypothesis to, to, and the basis for your assumptions that you have made. We have got to model the impact of what we do in a more financial orientated way because data metrics, they're not going to go away. And as I said on a couple of occasions, this is a shift that takes some time to do. So consider the manager's shift that they're going to have to do, the cultural shift and the educational process that you'll need to go through. As I said, um, I'm Dave Milner. I hope that you found that interesting. I've just tried to pull some excerpts from the book, Introduction to People Analytics. And as you can see on screen, um, that is the, the link if you're interested in, in exploring that a little bit more. I hope you found that interesting. And uh, if you wish to get in contact with me, um, either directly or through analytics and HR, please do. I'll be delighted to talk to you.